Thank you guys all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jamie Dunphy. I'm your host for this evening. Um, I'm a board member with Music Portland, where I, uh, I chair the Music Policy Council, um, leading the advocacy efforts for the Music Portland. And I'm also the uh, host of the wildly popular podcast, uh, Stumptown Soundcheck. Woo! With- it's about the, uh, the vital intersection of music and public policy. It's uh, riveting stuff. I'm sure you would love it. Pretty um, it's pretty niche. That's, yeah, it's pretty niche. But it's more or less why Mara and asked me to come and host this evening tonight. Because we want to have a conversation this evening about how decision makers, policy makers, business leaders, and community folks can revitalize their local economies by embracing the music industry that's already existing in our cities. Um, so with me this evening is author and music policy expert Shane Shapiro. Sh- Sh- <laughs> Shane is one of the world's leading music and culture policy experts. Um, he's a founder and chairman of the uh, economic consultancy Sound Diplomacy, founder and director of the global nonprofit Center for Music Ecosystems, and author of the book, This Must Be the Place, How Music Can Make Your City Better. Welcome, Shane. Yeah. That's on sale over there uh, at... Uh, via Powell's. Yeah. <laughs> um, also with me this, uh, this evening is Ajay Date, Vice President of Marketing at Travel Portland, um, which is our regional tourism industry. So Ajay's specific portfolio includes the leisure tourism efforts, which literally means people who are coming to Portland in order to enjoy Portland. Um, welcome, Ajay. Yeah. Yeah, applause. Thanks for having me. And... Uh, with little need for introduction, Mara McLaughlin is our trusty leader here at Music Portland. She's the co-founder and executive director of both Music Portland and Music Oregon. Music Portland, which is focused on the a- uh, economic development interests of the professional music, professional popular music industry, and Music Oregon, which focuses more on the cultural education and grant making supports yeah, for the yeah. music creators. So, welcome, Mara. Hello, y'all. Hey, M- Mr. Fife, could you close the door so that we don't get the noise from out there? Appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys all so much for being here. Shane, first of all, Shane, congratulations on the release of your book. Um, thank you very much. Would you do me a favor? Just sort of, would you frame the conversation of why we are here right now and sort of give everybody sort of at the, at the start a 50,000 foot take of, of what the hell we're talking about here? Yeah, sure. So, again, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm a big fan of Portland. I haven't been here since before COVID, uh, and I'm thrilled to be back. Um, And this is, I believe, show 48 for me. So I hope this is well rehearsed. (laughs) But I'm going to, you know, I I, I tend to start, I want us to kind of think of, we need to think of music a little bit differently. So... Um, I I tend to like to think about music the same way that we think about water, right? So I'm sure everyone's had a glass of water today or is having a glass of water now or you're having beer made from water. And, um, And, you know, when we're at home and we turn the tap on, we kind of ignore everything that went into making that moment happen for that moment to happen, right? Water just doesn't get to our taps in our homes. Obviously, we're paying for it. But in addition to that, it, you know, it has to get to us. It has to be cleaned. It has to have distribution, has to have filtration, sanitation, so on and so forth, right? There's a whole infrastructure that is happening behind the scenes for that moment to happen. But we don't notice that moment happening because it doesn't matter to us because it's happening, right? And I say clean water is only important when you don't have it. I think the exact same thing happens in most of our heads when we're listening to a song or when we're at a gig. I'm sure most of you are kind of active and passionate about music, but not everybody is. And, you know, when you're at a gig, you're probably not thinking about the caterer backstage, right? Or the, uh, you know, the person who designed the poster or the person uh, um, working sound or the manager of that artist or who made that guitar, you know? All of these are jobs and skills and vocations that if we understand, similarly to the way that we think about water, um, or we don't think about water, if we break it down, there's a whole infrastructure of jobs, of skills, of trades, of vocations that have to happen for music to happen. If those things don't happen, there is no music, 
right? Music is not a natural resource like water. It's something that we have to create as human beings. So I truly believe that in cities, we make choices about what we care about and what we don't care about, what we invest in and what we don't invest in, what we prioritize and what we don't prioritize. Those decisions, some of you may agree with, some of you may not agree with, but cities are just you know, groups of consensus kind of going over and over and over again based on prioritizing what we as a community deem as important. And I find that music doesn't tend to be considered in the same way that we would consider the importance of water, right? Obviously, we can't live without water, but I would argue we also probably can't live without music. Music may be one of the only things that, you know, we don't need to live, but I'm sure we would all struggle to live without. So I started this work, oh God, in 2013, 2014. There's someone in the room who knew me then. Um, but um, I worked at a record label way back when. And, um, and I, I, I'm from London, despite the way I sound. Apologies. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we had a lot of challenges in London uh, back then. And some work was put in by our previous mayor, mayor, mayor Boris Johnson to try to understand, it's true, he was our mayor. Uh, <laughs> he was at one point, uh, I, I did work for him. And um, so, but we discovered, you know, again, the royal we. So, so the, the mayor of London put a task force together because a whole bunch of venues were closing down, right? And this was this, um, there was a lot of foresight to do this. And the task force was made up of city employees, of music venue owners, and the venue that was, a venue that was near and dear to my heart, it's the venue that I convinced my, my I guess now wife, I guess, to uh, get back together with me when she broke up with me early in our relationship, had, uh, had closed down. It's, uh, it was called the Luminaire. It's now, called, it's now the Luminaire Apartments. And, um, and I was really frustrated about that. So when I saw the mayor of London had created this task force, I wanted to be a part of it, yet I had no idea what the heck I was doing. So I just emailed them and asked to be a part of it, and they ignored me uh, for months. <laughs> and a long story short, I decided uh, with a few friends to, to build kind of a, a conference around this topic because we thought we could pretend to be experts if we brought people together. And we invited the mayor's office down. They came down to this conference, which we held in, uh, in Brighton, which is just south of London. And a couple weeks later, I finally got a call from the mayor's office to be a part of this task force. And that started a, a three and a half year relationship of me working as a consultant in the mayor of London's office on music and nighttime economy. And the reason I'm saying this is that's where I realized that music was not considered as a core um, you know, civic issue in London because most of the problems that were the reason why these venues were closing down had nothing to do with music. They were, they were issues, I hope that's not because of me. Uh, they, they were issues uh, related to land use planning. They were issues related to alcohol and liquor licensing, um, around housing and where housing was going to be. There were particular nuances in the UK that exacerbated the problem um, around ways that planning regulations were interpreted at the time. But I realized that that is when we did not treat music in the same way that we treated things that we deemed as important, right? We deem housing as important. We deem providing electricity, providing public transit, providing health care is important. Um, but music and culture was the thing that we did after we had made a decision to prioritize all the important things. And the result was a whole bunch of venues were closing down. And in, in London, that was over 80 venues. A third of our venues had closed down in 10 years, between 2005 and 2015. I think I'm right, Misha, on that. Uh, about right. Uh, and, um, and this, to, to answer your question, Jamie, if I am, this is the thousand foot view that I've come to over the last 10 years, is that we have to think about music differently in our communities. And the way that I have thought about it, 
learning from the places that I've been able to work, and I've worked in well over 100 cities and places around the world in 30 countries. I've been lucky enough to travel a lot and unlucky to travel a lot, <laughs> um, is, is that when we have a music problem in a community, like a venue closes down, that's usually the simplest one, right, to explain because um, live music is always easier to deal with because you can see it, right? You can't see copyright, so it's harder to understand. Um, and when you have a venue closing down because of a, you know, of a, block, of a block of flats in an apartment building that's built next door, I know it, it happens everywhere. Um, to me, often the solution from the music perspective is we need to really focus on how we prioritize the music. So usually the solution to a music problem is more music or save that venue or more venues or more festivals. We have a very kind of music is a hammer and everything is a nail. And I, have, I agree with that. We need more venues. We need more festivals. But that argument has not worked uh, for me. What I have realized is, in the thousand-foot view that I'm hoping that we can come to, is we need to think of music more as a nail and everything else as a hammer. And we should need to ask different questions, like how do we create sustainable, meaningful tourism experiences, right? How do we get people to stop killing each other? How do we promote uh, health and well-being? How do we invest in education, right? How do we create jobs that AI isn't going to take away? These are all questions that cities are trying to answer right now. I believe that music is not, maybe not be the answer to all of those, but it's part of the answer to all of those. And through the work in the mayor's office and through you know, making mistakes, I have come to realize that the more that we can incorporate music into everything that a city takes seriously, it's, you know, it's workforce development strategy, it's investment plans, dealing with um, mental health issues, houselessness issues, health issues, as well as how to grow a sustainable, thriving music industry, because that's important too. But the more that we can think of music as a wider community member in that sense, the more we identify all these pathways where music can add value, where music can be a a way where we can talk to people we disagree with without, you know, never wanting to talk to them again. Or we can create a system that I believe is far more people focused rather than systems focused. And I've learned that that's, the, that, that's where I'm hoping we can come to. And, you know, the, when I wrote this book, I realized that, you know, what if a city is planning its 10-year strategy or five-year strategy. Every city does this, right? They put out these strategic plans that no one reads that have lots of euphemisms in them, um, like, you know, like sustainability and resilience. And they're important words, but um, lots of cities do this. What city do we want to be in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years? I'm sure Portland's done this, because every city has. Uh, and music tends to never fo feature in them, and culture rarely features in them. So I thought, well, what if music had a seat at the table, right? What if the head of planning, tourism, city manager, mayor, whoever else, sat around and said, well, what is this city? What are we striving to be? What are we going to prioritize? If I had a seat at that table, what would I say? What would I advocate for? What would I try to convince? And that, that's the book. So the book was essentially me trying to convince myself that I had something to say in that situation, that I had a clear plan of action that could be interpreted and localized in as many places as possible, but was truly about how we can incorporate music more deeply into the decisions that we take based on what we care about. And right now, we are bolting music onto our communities. We're not building it in. And we have to think much more differently about the role that music plays in our cities. And I think that just, you know, just as a like knock on the head here, there's any city that could do this. <laughs> it is a city that is synonymous with music. It is a city that that still, you know, is recognizably known for its music history and heritage. You mean us, right? Yeah, I okay. mean you. <laughs> and um 
And I truly believe that if we're going to create uh, communities that you know, are adapting to the future, communities that are treating people as people, um, I think that Portland has an incredible opportunity to do that because you, you kind of have the stuff that you can't really create that easily, right? You can't create famous artists immediately. You can't create amazing DIY record labels immediately. You just can't do that, right? That, you have it or you don't. But you can change policy. You can create structures. You can change how cities operate. And I don't mean just city council to pick on you, Jamie, and um, future Jamie. But um, uh, it's, 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 I mean, the city in general. I yeah. mean, in a holistic way. So that's everything from tourism to economic development to the music community to all of you in this room. And I'm hoping that my book kind of provides that type of, you know, thinking of, you know, we can, we can talk about this differently and all be better off because of it. Well, without any spoilers, tell us about your book. And I want to know also, tell us about how decision makers have been reacting to your book so far. Um, I got some really, like, I got some really pissy reviews on Goodreads, which uh, <laughs> I have no idea why. But so if anyone, if anyone is A, reads it, B, likes it, and is kind enough to review it, graciously appreciate it. Amazon seems to like it. Um, no, the... Um, I get a lot of, I've never thought of that before. Yeah. I get a lot of that. Um, I, you know, I, I, I specifically wrote it so that it wasn't academic. Yeah. That was a deliberate and intentional thing, right? It is not academic. It is written plainly, I hope. I wanted anyone to understand it. You don't have to like music to get it, I hope. There are academic books about this. Yeah. The people who know, there are, there are academics working on music cities, music policy, music ecosystems, whatever you call it, th those do exist. Um, but I've gotten a lot of that, and I've definitely gotten a lot of um, interest. Uh, but what we have also seen is, a, is that there's a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a, a need. My book has created, I don't think my book has, my book has been part of a system <laughs> that has created a need for for us to be better translators in terms of how, pardon my French, how shit gets done. Yep. Um, and this is all about how cities, and this is how cities raise money, right? Not just through uh, tax, but through other ways. How cities literally work and don't. How music literally works and doesn't. Um, the fact that most people, and this is not a criticism, this is just the way it is, most people have no idea how music works mm -hmm. at its most basic level. Very few people have been inside a recording studio. Mm -hmm. Music is the closest thing to magic I feel that we're ever gonna come to. Um, and that's fine. You don't have to know how many people know how an airplane works. Right. How many people know how this thing works? <laughs> like, it's, that's normal. Um, but we have to be better translators to our communities because Music is not a point of sale business. We're not selling a single thing. Um, copyright is complicated. And, you know, we I say we, we kind of obsess over the word intellectual and forget the word property. Uh, and, um, and I think that I have realized that there's a willingness to have conversations on both sides. So cities are looking at, in the United States, right, COVID <clears throat> money is drying up, right? That is a reality, unfortunately. I am well aware of the social challenges that Portland and many other communities are facing around drugs and, and homelessness. It's not just a Portland problem. It's a problem in Europe too, uh, and in Canada, and lots of other countries. Um, and whatever we're doing doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> right? Yep. Um, music is not a panacea. It's, but it, you know, and it's no more to me important than any other art form. All art is valuable to me, uh, from dance and murals and theater and everything. But music is the most accessible um, because you're, we're all born with an instrument, right? When I say the word music, it means something different to every single one of you, and each of those meanings is important. Um, and, that, and that it's, you know, I call it like, and I refer to it in a way as, as like the ignorance of ubiquity, right? We completely ignore how ubiquitous music is because it's ubiquitous. Um, 
So cities are waking up to it, but they don't really have the, I, I think that we're getting to that point where we're starting to have a serious conversation. It's taken 10 years. Um, where, you know, how can we raise a bond to, to invest heavily in music infrastructure? Mm -hmm. how, you know, that's how do we find other people's money, yeah. right? That's what it is. Some, you know, how uh, to invest in music in one way or another in this community. How do we reimagine our, our healthcare infrastructure? And I know in the U.S. it's different to the U.K., but, um, but still, like, the organizations like Smash in Seattle are, and, and there's a similar one in Austin, that kind of do these group plans for musicians um, are, you know, are actually more cost effective, yeah. you know, than a musician not having health care and then going to the emergency room. And, uh, you know, so there are all these, I think that, I, I'm hoping that my book serves as a, a bit of a tipping point to have a better conversation rather than how do we just brand ourselves as a music city like maybe I'm to blame for some of that. You're probably to blame for some of that. Uh, but like, that's great. Branding yourself is good. Uh, tourism is incredibly important. We need to get people into hotels to pay tax. But it's um, but that's just one side of it. Or you know, and and frankly, just investing solely in growing the music industry in and of itself, that is also not the whole strategy of a city. But that's the that's the beating heart of it, right? That's the beating heart of it, and all the veins and and arteries will fail without uh, a city that recognizes that music is a business, that it respects music as a business, that it has systems to understand music as a business. <laughs> this does not exist in a lot of places. So I think that um, I think and I hope and I'm really optimistic that we're having better conversations now. Maybe because we're facing bigger problems in music. Uh, and wider art and culture are are genuine solutions to some of those problems. So, COVID has fundamentally changed everything. Yeah. Yes. But and, yes and no. Yes and no. Exactly. Uh, are there good examples of cities that were were embodying some of the ideas and principles you were uh, you're talking about yeah. before COVID? And are there any examples of cities that have pivoted since COVID? That's a good question. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, I have you have to shout out to to Seattle and the work that they do, mm -hmm. um, and King County. They have a joined up approach, a relative, I think, a relatively fluid joined up approach, yeah. um, and they've been doing it forever. They've been doing it really since what two thousand and five, two thousand and six, um, in a in an organized way. Um, one of the cities that I'm most proud of that I've been lucky to work in before COVID that embraced music in a real big way was Fort Worth, Texas. Um, they, that was the tourism board actually that led it. Um, and they set up an office called Here Fort Worth, like a music office. The music office did drop-in sessions. They have monthly meetups. They, um, they have a, a small fund where they'll give you 300 bucks if you go and play a show outside of Fort Worth and then tweet about it or Instagram about it, you get a $300 stipend. Um, that's paid by hot tax. Um, you know, and there's a cap, right? Um, the city has done quite a lot, uh, and they kept doing it during COVID. And I'm quite proud of, there's one guy especially who's been a part of that. And I'm quite proud of, you know, the work that they have done as an example. Um, after COVID, you know, one of the places that we've done a lot of work in, uh, it's an entire chapter of the book, is Huntsville, Alabama. If anyone has ever been to Huntsville, it's where NASA is. NASA's not in Houston, just, you know, they're in Huntsville. Uh, there's more rocket scientists per capita in any other city in America than Huntsville. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, and the city invested heavily in music as a workforce development strategy. Purely how to attract people away from Silicon Valley, um, uh, and they invested in a big capital infrastructure project, which involved new roads and neighborhoods, but also a minor league baseball stadium uh, with the best name. They're called the Rocket City Trash Pandas. Uh, yeah, go Trash Pandas. And they're also playing the same division as the best minor league baseball 
team name, the Savannah Bananas. Yeah. Uh, and um, so... Don't, don't sleep on the Portland Pickles, though. Yeah, Portland oh, Portland Pickles. Pickles, that's good, too. And their yeah. farm team, the Gherkins. Yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. We could go in making bacon as well as good. Uh, and uh, the... Um, so... But in a, in an, as part of that plan was a, a comprehensive kind of music study that, that we did. And one of the things that we found was a lot of people were leaving Huntsville on weekends to go to gigs in Nashville, an hour up the road, or Atlanta, about an hour and a half down the road. Quite a competitive environment. Um, so included, so the city invested in an, in an amphitheater. It's an 8,000 capacity amphitheater called the Orion. Please check it out. We were named, named one of the best venues in America last year. Um, but that was designed with the city. It's run independently. It's not run by one of the big companies. The big companies put shows in, but it's run independently. Um, and the city owns it. City built it, city owns it. They rent it to this company to run independently called TVG. Um, but there was a whole citywide design process that went into that. So one of the contracts, uh, one of the things in the contract of the amphitheater is you have to do at least 100 community events a year. Because it drives me mad that you have these big venues that are open 20 days. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. And football stadiums, too. It's like eight days, 10 days. This is when you're in Nashville and you drive past the big stadium in the Valley. And you're like, that's open 10 times a year. You can host two concerts. I just don't understand that. So, so there's yoga on the stage. And there's food markets and vinyl markets and poetry readings and farmers markets and all sorts of things. Because the venue has to be part of the community. They've really dug into that. They, <coughs> They have a city music board, similarly to Music Portland. Um, they have a music officer in city council, paid for by the city. Uh, they, um, and they're doing all sorts of other things. But I think that COVID, um, I think that we have to also, COVID has created a really interesting kind of juxtaposition that I have a theory about. And it seems every time I say it, people are like, yeah, that's all right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. Um, but First off, COVID is the best, in the worst possible way, is the best case study we will ever have about why music matters. Full stop. Okay? And we don't take advantage of that enough. Um, where would we be without it? Uh, what it has done, though, in its trauma that has been inflicted on all of us, I believe it has created um, a whole bunch of us that are yearning or gravitating much more to the familiar because familiarity is comforting, right? We are all listening to more music that we know. We are. But we are also listening to more music than ever before. Statistically, that is true. As of two days ago, a new report came out. The music industry grew by 10% 10, 10 last year, 10.8%. Yeah, it's 14% the year before, so a little less. But still, 10%, you know, pretty good. Um, but more tickets were sold last year in 2023 than in any year ever. We are all going to see more live music. The problem is, which is good, is good and to be applauded. The challenge, I'm not saying it's a problem, I would argue it's a challenge and an opportunity, is, it's fine, it's kitchen, is that by, because we, I believe we are all processing trauma by going to things that are comforting to us. To most people, that means we're going to see, to, to see Taylor Swift and Beyonce and those types of artists. That and we like are- It was like 90% of the tickets, right? Was yeah, Taylor Swift and Beyonce. because um, discovery, discovery is, takes effort and discovery is also exposing oneself. If, and we are all still, I believe, and me personally as well, I think we're still struggling to open ourselves out in the same way that we did pre-COVID. What that means is most of the shows are the bigger shows. Hence, the big companies, Live Nation, AEG, are having bumper years, uh, incredibly bumper years, mm -hmm. uh, and grassroots music venues are struggling. Um, and many are closing down. Uh, and this is, this to me is uh, an issue that cities need to really take seriously because I think that we should think of our music venues more as community centers or think of them as innovation hubs or accelerators. If every band is a business and their songs are their intellectual property, then you've got 20 businesses a week being incubated in this accelerator hub. You only need one song, right? You only need one, like, like an accelerator investing in apps, 
Same thing, you need one Tinder. <laughs> and there you go. Um, I think we need to think differently about the value of our small to medium sized venues and infrastructure, not just venues, but general music infrastructure, because we, it's gonna take us a lot more time, I think, to process our trauma from COVID, and we are all going to continue to yearn for familiar, and what that means is we're gonna see a lot more of these venues struggle. So we have to think differently about how we invest in them, how we value them, how we recognize them, how we tax them, um, how we value what happens inside the building versus what the dirt is worth. We tend to value the dirt more than what happens inside the building. Um, that's, a, that's a problem in the UK. That's a big problem in the UK as well. Uh, and I don't have a full answer for this other than what an incredible opportunity to reimagine you know, places to congregate. What an incredible opportunity in our community to think differently about music venues. And they're not just music venues. These are, you know, these are places where the community can thrive and recuperate and deal with the trauma that we have in that way. Um, and, and that, to me, is something that most cities have not realized after COVID. Um, and also, when you have, like, the, you know, the venues got the uh, shuttered venue operating grant, I think it was called, right? The 16 billion or 15 billion. And this always happens. When you have a big policy win, people forget about you. <laughs> because you just had a big policy win. Go mm -hmm. away. Yep. <laughs> So we have to think really long and hard now that COVID money is drying up, that the trend of what we are willing to invest in in terms of live music is not going to change, at least for the little, for the next few years. We're going to see more famous artists get on the road because it's, you know, it's worth it. Um, and great, all the power to, I want to see these artists, obviously, but we have to think long and hard uh, about, um, about the fact that our business resembles much more like an hourglass than a pipeline. And it will continue to bellow out and continue to shrink in the middle. And I think that cities, not just local government cities in the widest sense of the word, uh, have the power and to me the responsibility to address that. So my experience in Portland, and I, I feel like it is relatively talk accurate. Now? I got one more question for I got one more question right, for Shane. You're doing great, Shane. <laughs> you're doing great. I got questions for all of them. I wrote it down. Oh, it's three okay, pages. I'll do one more. Don't worry, you got one more over here. But I'm glad you guys are. Thank you so much for coming as well. Wow. Yeah. Right. Um, this is amazing. Thank you. So my experience as a musician in this city, and and as a touring musician, I experienced this elsewhere. What is that? In a lot of areas, music is treated as it's lumped in with arts and culture, and it is treated as a nice to have. At the same right. time. A lot of the arts and non, or the arts uh, organizations view music as a for-profit art, and so it's often excluded from yeah. funding. Mm -hmm. How does that dynamic impact the effectiveness of the policies that you're yeah. suggesting? I love this country. I, I, <laughs> I love, I genuinely, you know, I have a deep, deep seat. I'm not American, as you know, I'm Canadian and British. I have a deep-seated love for this country. I've been to all 48 continental states. I get to go to Alaska next week, so only Hawaii after that. It's a good but way to end the you tour. You guys create these barriers and these boundaries and these differentiations for the stupidest reasons. Well, first <laughs> off, obviously, it all, it, all, obvi it all stems from systemic racism from the first yeah. part, okay? The entire land use, land use in general, right, is a way to keep people apart. Yep. Um, and... And unpicking that is, is really hard. <laughs> um, not even, you know, harder often in progressive places than in less progressive places. Um, I think that one of the differentiations that does no one any benefits is this for profit versus non profit uh, view of music. Yeah. So obviously, Americans for the Arts, which is an amazing organization, I'm a big fan of theirs. They do this economic impact study every two years, it's only non profit. Our uh, music, and it's meaningful and meaningless at the same time because you're missing uh, half, of, half of your constituents. Mm -hmm. And then when we create these barriers, and by the way, every country does this, not just the states. And I would argue it's probably worse in a lot of European countries because we've been around longer to make it worse. <laughs> uh, and um, it's true, it, time matters, right? Yeah. Like, uh, and um, when we do that, then we ascribe value onto things in a way that may not make any sense. So, you know, commercial music is one thing, 
and the non-commercial music. I think this even concept of non-commercial music is offensive. It's like the concept of world music. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the center of the world. Uh, it's true. D d I, I don't like that term. It's offensive. And, uh, you know, we should just call it, you know, music for white people not made by white people. <laughs> so, and I know this is being filmed. Uh, so, uh, but I truly believe that. So I'm going to, you know, um, and no, we create this differentiations. You know, every, every, all music is valuable. Everyone is valuable. All music to me is, is interesting in and of its own right, whether I listen to it or not. Um, and by creating these differentiations, what we do is we create systems that, um, that over time, it, you know, exacerbate a certain type of decision made by often a certain type of person. And you always gravitate to things that you've already done before. So, you know, the funding um, certain types of, of quote-unquote high art music from tradition, classical, opera, ballet, jazz, that's something I support. I've, I, I love all of those genres. Um, and I want symphonies to be funded. I want ballet to be funded. I think they're really important. But so is hip-hop. So, so is metal. So is EDM. So is everything else. But classical's been around a lot longer. So, you know, and everything takes time. And because it's been around a lot longer, there's, uh, a much, there's much more framework to work on. Mm -hmm. So how you fund a symphony or how you build a concert hall, it's, it's simpler to understand. And we always say it's the path of least resistance to the buyer. You do the simplest thing possible. And um, so we have systems in place to develop, builds, and support um, concert halls, right? And we have for a long time. Um, thank you, Misha. <laughs> Where, how do we have community, um, do we have community-based programs to invest in, um, in emerging hip-hop or, or a subgenre of hip-hop? Yes, but we've only had it for a shorter period of time. And then you add on racism, you add on a fact that people, again, when, you know, one person's music is another person's noise, you create these differentiations. And it's our job I believe that, that everyone in this room, anyone who cares about music policy, has to have an agnostic view towards it, right? It is not about what I like. Nope. It is about what matter. It is about what makes sense for the community. I almost certainly don't like your band. Oh, no. Well, of course, my band, no. We were terrible, and that was 20 years ago. Uh, but, um, no, but it's, it's, you know, I... But also, every band matters. It's, it's, yeah. it's this thing that, you know... The music industry is really difficult. There are just too many mouths to feed. There just are. There's winners and losers, and there's just going to be a lot more losers than winners. But it doesn't mean that someone is less valued. Right. Um, and we have perpetuated a planning system, land use system, a, a system that completely ties live music to alcohol and liquor licensing. Most alcohol and liquor licensing policy was invented either during or after prohibition. <laughs> So it comes from a different time and has different objectives. It's really difficult to unwind things once they're created. I've learned that with City Code. Just build stuff on, it's like the worst Jenga game ever. Uh -huh. uh, and, um, and, and, and then that creates these, you know, nonprofit music deserves this, for-profit music deserves that. And I believe that the work that like Music Portland does, and you guys are incredibly lucky to have something like Music Portland. This does not exist in most places, all right? This is, and I'm not just saying that because you're beside me. <laughs> music Portland does not exist in most, a lot of cities don't have music offices. A lot of cities don't have maras. Most cities don't. Um, no cities have maras other than us. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it's the way we, we are, again, it comes back to what I said originally is we are trying to create change in a system that was set up for different reasons other than, you know, a system that was not set up to recognize music as an economy, borderline not recognize music as an ecology, and then you add on the social, uh, racial, class, all the challenges that every city in America faces. We have a system that just, that, that, you know, needs better translators. And one of the things that we have to do 
and that's really, really important, is we have to build a data and evidence base, which you guys do have for the most part, I would argue here, lots of cities don't, that can, that can back up the translation. And that says, no, it's not just about nonprofit music, it's about all sorts of music. No, it's not just about the symphony, it's about the symphony and um, grime or whatever. Um, and, and I think that that is, I truly believe that that's just starting to happen. Yeah. I think COVID helped with that. Yeah. COVID, you know, the, the music industry organized to a, whoever here works in the commercial music industry, holy shit, did the, the music industry organize in ways that they never organized before mm -hmm. because of COVID. Um, I was talking to the executive director of, of the National Independent Venue Association, Neva. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a really good friend of mine. He's a lovely, lovely man named Steven. And, um, and he reminded me of something that uh, the first trade association for the airplane industry was launched eight years after the Wright Brothers plane, right? How long have music venues been open? And Neva was created three years ago? And that really put into perspective for me. And he was like, do you know how far we have to come? You know how much work we have to do? to even be at a point where we can compare ourselves to any other industry, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and that gave me that perspective. And thank you, Stephen. Um, but also, it, it filled me with so much hope because I'm like, what other industry gets to chart its own path in this way? Yeah. And, and we, we trade in something that, again, is, um, <clears throat> is, is so meaningful to people uh, air, air, airplanes are too, but I believe music, music's more important. And, you know, I always say, how, how many, who here has been to a wedding or a funeral without music? Right? Music, soundtracks, we trust music to be, to, to, to frame the emotion of the most important moments of our lives. Right? I'm sure very few of us exercise towards music. We're all trying to better ourselves in one way or another, physically or mentally using music. This is something, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get on an airplane to feel good. <laughs> like, I get on an airplane to go somewhere. Right. Um, so, like, it's what incredible power we have. If we just leveraged it and if we just got organized and we had a better data and evidence base to demonstrate that and we spoke in a unified way without, um, without picking winners and losers, without choosing that someone is important over someone else. Um, and also, whilst recognizing and actively uh, engaging with and tearing down the past, you know, we have to be much, much better in our industry dealing with, um, with, with all, all forms of, of equity and social inclusion. And that's in every country that we work in, right? Some countries it's, well, every country it's race. But some countries as well, it's class, it's gender, it's neurodiversity um, and, and, and many others, Ac literal accessibility. My mom walks with a walker and just going to gigs with her is a nightmare, right? And she loves music. Like without her, I wouldn't listen to Leonard Cohen at least. Uh, and um, she really likes Leonard Cohen, Canadian. You know, 60s, si si late 60s Canadian woman likes Leonard Cohen. And, uh, but, um, but, all of those kinds of things as well, and, and I'll end with this, are, are not just music issues, right? Access is an issue everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, race is an issue everywhere. Mm -hmm. Class is an issue, for the most part, everywhere. I think that addressing it through music, again, is not gonna solve everything, but what an incredible, powerful tool to create change. And then at the same time, we're doing it in a way that is creating jobs for people who play music. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. And creating value for people who play music or who work with people who play music in whatever way. That is what sustains a thriving music industry and music ecosystem. And again, if Portland can't do it, of all cities, like what hope does any city have Absolutely. in my end? Like if Portland can't do it, like I grew up listening to music from your city. I did, like I did. Yep. So. You know, um, and, and some of the artists from Portland, just I was reminded um, uh, from, from 
I don't remember who was here, but I was reminded of the Dandy Warhols. I love the Dandy Warhols. I com- kind of forgot they're from here, but yeah. I love them. I, you know, um, these are the, it, it's, a, again, if any city can leverage music to improve the lives of the people who live in that city and also share the beauty of that city with outsiders so they come here and experience it. If Portland can't do it, like, you know, Your what, hope, what, busted, hope will, yeah. what hope will Eugene have? Well? <laughs> <laughs> That's my, I just... <laughs> there you see. So I'm joking. I know. I I know Eugene is an amazing college town, <laughs> Mara. Uh, but I just um, picked it because it's another city in Oregon. It's a good city, and I hear it's a it's lovely city. It's fine. Um, so Portland is a relatively, I mean, relatively so, small city. Though, thank you all right? for listening. Yeah, thank you. Shane, we got more questions. Uh, Shane's not going here, but give him a round because he just talked for 45 minutes. That was great. I feel like and we're going to get to a little bit more panel like some conversation of this is now. Come back to, to bite yeah. me in the backside, Mara. No, drink your beer now, though. You get to actually take a break. All right. uh, Mara, talking a bit about Portland now. Um, Portland is a relatively small city, but um, you know, Shane was mentioning the Americans for the Arts recently came out and said that uh, the nonprofit arts in Portland is about two hundred and eighty million dollars a year here. Um, the state of Oregon did an economic impact study and learned that commercial music is $3.8 billion a year here, with 75 to 80% of that here in the Portland metro. Mm-hmm. Um, according to the state of Oregon, in fact, I'm going to brag about this. This same thing, music in Oregon is bigger than cannabis, it is bigger than timber, it is bigger than salmon, it pays more in taxes, and it employs more people, all without any sort of recognition or support. So, Mara, my question is for you. What would Portland look like if... Business, the music industry, and the government embraced and recognized our music industry. Well, I, th- I, I mean, I'm right along with, with Shane in so much of this. You know, people don't debate whether we need parks or why we need parks or how important things are. They just debate how to make them happen and how to make sure they're connected to the thinking. Um, and Portland, I think, has had a kind of cultivated denial of our music ecology. Like, it's like, oh, we don't want to, if we don't mention it, we don't have to pay for it. Or if we don't acknowledge it, we don't have to, you know, do anything about it. And if we, you know, and it won't become one more thing in the weird calculus that it takes to run a city. I think if, as Shane describes, if we look at it as an asset, as an incredible driver of workforce, not just a, you know, building workforce, but frankly, in our Brew City, you need to retain workers. And we need to make sure that businesses are centering on the idea that as much as I love the symphony, millennial, college-educated, highly employable young people are not going to move to our city because we've got a kick-ass symphony. They're coming because of this internationally respected music economy. So it isn't about supporting or engaging or thinking about or integrating the thinking of what you need to get done with music. It's about acknowledging that it's an employee benefit that is an imperative for business success in our city. And I think there is this weird like, la, 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 we just don't want to think about it. Um, And with the, the arts and culture being so hamstrung by such ridiculous underfunding, you know, the arts and culture community is also like, we can't float our own boat. Please don't add another giant culture on top of it. So I think everybody has been sort of avoidant of it. And I think the hope and the reason I was excited to bring Shane here is it shouldn't be something we fear. It should be something that absolutely we see as a superpower relative to every other place in the country. We're the largest independent music ecology in the country. And we are recognized as an incubator and a tastemaker and a place where the next big thing comes from because we're not a market-driven music town. And it's very exciting when you connect with a business leader or with people in tourism who get that and go, wow, this is, this is a superpower. We can use this. The challenge is it's really hard to scale that kind of contact and finding those people. We need consensus. We need government buy-in. We need tourism buy We need all of the voices chiming in the same <clears throat> chorus to acknowledge this and loop it all in together and I think with it, we can exceed everything pre-COVID. We can make this a better city than it ever was before by doing this. 
That's me. You know, Shane uh, outlined a lot of the ways that public policy could be used, not uh, not specifically to s to support the music industry, but to use music as a event vehicle through which public policy mm -hmm. is achieved. Um, but the other side of that really is um, working with the private sector and getting the buy-in. What has been your experience here in Portland, working with trying to get the pub, the private sector to financially and uh, I mean just strategically support mm -hmm. and uh, and financially support the music industry in Portland. Um, Portland Metro Chamber, formerly Portland Business Alliance, Greater Portland Inc., and BBPDX have all absolutely acknowledged that our music culture is a real competitive advantage for their members. We've <clears throat> talked with lots and lots of large employers who acknowledge that you know it's our environment, it's our you know lauded food culture, and it's our music scene that are key assets that they use when developing talent. Um, and so we've had some success, you know, as a small, grassroots, scrappy nonprofit, engaging and finding some really great businesses that recognize this. We've got sponsors of Portland Music Month. This year's Portland Music Month raised eighty to ninety thousand dollars for our musician grant program without touching any cultural funding. We're gonna pause and applaud that. Eighty thousand dollars in grants going to musicians based off of ticket sales. So. Yeah, last year we gave away sixty thousand dollars. Each year it goes up. Um, so we have a number of businesses that are starting to stand with music because they see it as a as an advantage. The ROI. This is not a philanthropic investment. This is a returns based investment in something that is good for them. And that's what makes it different from some of the subsidy driven art forms that really do require kind of philanthropic support. We're trying to get them to think about it differently in a more, frankly, self-serving way. But it, it's not going to scale. We need a larger consensus to make this thing work, because I can only talk so fast and so long. <laughs> what are some specific challenges that, and obstacles here in Portland that we face for Shane's vision to be a reality? Um, I think this denial sort of this convenient denial that comes in from a lot of places. We've got to debunk that. And I know Shane is quick to say it isn't just about branding, but it is about voicing. It's a very different thing to say that mu we love music. Name it. Get together with it. You know, Nashville and Austin added their brands, you know, live music capital of the world and music city. And then they everybody leaned into it. The restaurants celebrate it with items on their menu, the street signs have it, all of these different things. It's about everybody kind of embedding it into their DNA um, that says, we are lucky, we live in the most amazing music city. Whether you ever go to a music event or not, we need the population, we need the grandmas to go, oh, hell yeah, we're in the grass music city. And that matters because their grandchildren will visit them. <clears throat> Why does it matter? Why does music matter to people? And that's what we have to do is just build this thing in to an essence of who we are. And then obviously it's solving all these problems. It's improving public safety. It's doing, yes, it is, it's a great nail. I love the metaphor. Um, but it's also, it is something, a big part of us, and we need to connect the dots for people as to why it matters to everybody. Um, I have a, a guy who is the head of drama at Lewis and Clark, who when I first told him about Music Portland said, well, this is a very hard thing, Barry, he's Czech. And he said, you know, when I go to New York, every ditch digger in New York City who will never go to a Broadway show feels very proud of living in the best theater town in the world. He said, that's what you have to do with music. You have to make every single person have a pride of place and, a, and a, just, a, just a, a chauvinism about where they are that says, this is something special. And it's also solving a bunch of problems. Ajay, you finally, your turn, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so your work with Travel Portland has focused on leisure tourism, like trying to get people to come to Portland to you know, visit our restaurants and our parks and to go to Powell's and to go to Voodoo Donuts. But we've had a rolling series of crises that have really driven tourists away. How are you thinking about our about Portland's perceived identity versus our real identity versus the identity that we hope that we will become. Yeah, I mean, obviously those of us that live here, we know we've gone through a lot. Um, not just COVID like everyone's gone through, but you know, the, 
the reckoning after George Floyd um, took a particular um, path here in Portland. Um, you know, we had longer protests here than anywhere else. People stayed on the streets longer. And it, there were reasons for that. I mean, we have a progressive culture here. We take a lot of pride. But we did put it to the test here uh, in a lot of ways. And it wasn't pretty all the time. But I think that, that reckoning in a lot of ways has really shown us a way um, in terms of what kind of city we can be. It's really, it's really uh, created a path for that. And you've seen that. And, and from a tourism standpoint, yeah, sure, reputational challenges aside, and you know, certainly between being a political punching bag and uh, in, the, in the national media, um, and then in the wake of that with, with homelessness, which was always there, and fentanyl and drugs and all those things that were always there under the surface. And oh, by the way, are happening in every other city in America. Um, and that is not to excuse us dealing with our own problems here, because we need, we have, but, but, you know, all that has shown that we, you know, in the wake of that, if you look at things like our food scene, which was lauded prior to COVID and for many years and, and had been growing and up and coming for a long time, uh, and it was built around a lot of independent restaurants and a lot of chefs who said, I don't need, to, I don't need a uh, Michelin star. I just want to cook what I want to cook and make one and be creative and do something cool. And I'm going to do it in Portland because I can. And that's the scene that incubated over many, many years. And that scene, if you look at it now, one thing that's very different about that scene, um, it's not just you know, white bearded dudes with tattoos that are making the, 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 if you look at the James Beard Awards that we've won recently, if you look at the top restaurants that are in Bon Appetit that are from Portland, are, there's more diversity in that scene than there has ever been. Um, and that is not necessarily by accident, okay? That is a, that is something that is in the wake of a lot of people finally looking ourselves in, in the eyes in Portland and going, hey, we, we've been talking this shit for a long time. We haven't done anything about it, right? And to what your point, Mira, about, I'm hearing, by the way, I'm hearing a lot of the language you guys are using is echoing, I think, a lot of the things that we, uh, we've been, I think, needed to address and are addressing in this town. You know, the idea of, you know, dealing with stuff and looking it in the eye, I think that's finally been happening. Because I think I've been in Portland my whole adult life, pretty much, 30-something years, since the early 90s. Um, and it was always kind of an aw shucks. We didn't take ourselves too seriously. And anything that was awesome here, everyone kind of, oh, that's fine. You know, I guess it's cool. I guess, you know, what, you guys came here for that? You like that? You know, we always were kind of had this humility slash aw shucksness mm -hmm. that I suppose was charming back then. But you know what? Pre-hipster. Pre pardon my, yeah, but pardon my language. Get the fuck over it. Like, yeah, like, yeah. It, like, we're a bigger town than we were. We've grown a lot. We are a big city. We have big city problems. And we also yeah. have to deal with this stuff and manage it in a very deliberate way, right? And I think um, we have to get our hands on it. Um, and if we want to keep continuing to be in the city that we want to be, we have to really be deliberate about that. And I think I've seen a lot of action towards that. And I think it is doing the things that you're talking about. Um, and I'm sure you're going to be talking about as you're campaigning for city council um, is we have to we have to have policies around these things like music. We have to take care of it and nurture it. Um, and, and the other thing that and I, I may have forgotten your question at this point, okay. but the, the other great. thing. <laughs> the other thing is, is that we have to nurture it in a way that's authentic to what we have here. And so I do take, you know, I do wonder when we talk about branding ourselves, um, you know, I don't want us to just chase, you know, Music City tags. And, you know, we're not going to, I don't want us to be, we're not going to be Seattle Junior or, or hey, look, it's, it's another Nashville. Or, like, we have our own scene. We've had it for a long time. Um, one of the things we do in the tourism side is here, we don't have a lot of tourism product in Portland. We don't have a Space Needle. We don't have a Fisherman's Wharf. We tend to really celebrate what Portlanders love about Portland, like breweries, right? Like, and um, if you're coming to Portland, it's because a lot of times when people used to come to Portland, it's because they knew somebody here. And they said, yeah, come visit. What do you want to do? Well, we'll just do the stuff we do. We're going to go to this brewery. We're going to go to this on this hike. 
we're going to go to get to this donut shop. We're going to go see this band at this venue down the street. And that's the kind of experiences you have here. And that's what we need to maintain. You know, I live in the um, Concordia neighborhood. I've had for 25 years or so. Well, it's been, was rebranded by a real estate agent since Alberta Arts many years ago. But um, it was, uh, you know, I live literally doors down from Alberta Rose Theater, which is a gem of a place. And it is... They have music there almost every single night. Uh, but it was shuttered for a year and a half during COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it really concerned me, it, besides all the restaurants that were in that ecosystem too, and the bars. And, you know, it really took the life out of the neighborhood for a long time. And it was so amazing to see it as it came back. And it's, you know, it thrives. And it's, it's a neighborhood venue that, that really speaks to what's great about Portland because it, it, is embedded and lives in the neighborhood in such an organic way. And you don't hear people go, I, I live, like I said, I live right down the way. I don't care about the parking in my neighborhood. I, it's a mild inconvenience, but I don't care because we have this great venue that people come visit and it really adds so much life to our neighborhood. And you know, it, it's those kind of things that we need to maintain and protect, but that's what people who come and visit us think is special about our city. So I think as we do that, and celebrate it, we have to be ground up with that. Mm -hmm. We cannot be top down. Um, you know, we don't have, the food scene is a good example of that. And I think, you know, we, even on the corporate level, you know, we look at Portland, we don't have a lot of Fortune 500 money here. Uh, and that makes certain things hard, mm -hmm. but it also creates a lot of opportunities because we're run by thousands, hundreds and thousands of small businesses. And those are the people we need to nurture, and those are the people ultimately gonna help call the shots. And those are the people that government needs to be looking after all the time. It also means that, you know, nobody's gonna have outdo influence, you know, hopefully. That there's gonna be a more, you know, egalitarian approach. It also makes it messy and difficult. It's gonna get messier, 12 yeah, city council messy. people, right? Like, so. But that messiness creates a lot of diversity. It can create a lot of um, it can create a lot of voices and bring a lot of people to the table. And I just think that's and from a tourism standpoint, yeah, you know, it's easy for us to get the big swings and and go. You know, there's some easy wins. We have a lot of hotels in this town. There's some big ones. We have a Ritz Carlton in this town, which honestly, when they heard about it, made no sense to me at all. Uh, but it's a beautiful property, and sure, the more the merrier, right? But like, you know. We also have some great boutique hotels who, that also support some music venues and other things. You know, we have the McMinimits, you know, like what, I mean, talk about like a whole bunch of unique venues, you know, that support a bunch of different food and, and, and a lot of jobs, you know, like that's uh, not every, pl no place has places like that. So I think it's, it's up to us to continue to nurture those things for locals, because if we do it for locals, it's always gonna be a great product for tourists. Yeah, I, I always wonder, I, you know, your, your basketball team is called the Trailblazers. Don't talk about the no, basketball no, but, team right now. No, no, but, <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's a subject. Oh, they're not very good? No, but the name, the name, think about that. Is it really about green space, or is it about the way that the city actually has created you know, has led the way in so many different ways. I like that. You know? So, uh, Ajay. Sorry, I didn't know no, you guys weren't very good. I, <laughs> I have no idea. There's a big rift between musicians and sports fans, and also the Blazers kind of suck right now, so. Well, um, they'll be good at some point. They'll be good sometime. Yeah. Um, so how, how has Travel Portland historically thought about or included Portland's music scene as part of the leisure travel portfolio? And... How do we, as a music scene, advocate to pull that identity out from the broader lumping of Voodoo Donuts and Powell's Books? Yeah, I mean, it's funny that no you mentioned- No offense to Powell's Books, we love you. No, we love Powell's Books. Uh, and Powell's Books continues to be great because locals love it, yeah. right? And they're engaged in the community. Voodoo, I'm not gonna say a lot about Voodoo, but uh, just, yeah. you know, um, it's a different, Voodoo's not ours anymore. Voodoo's no, no open idea. in Austin, and it's open in Hollywood, and it's open in Japan. Yeah. It's not really ours anymore, but the, the ecosystem that created Voodoo, when, back when they were 
put NyQuil and cereal and donuts and people were like, holy shit, there's, you know, like, that was, that's a Portland thing that created that because it was yeah. kind of gonzo and weird and it could happen here because people were like, why not? And we'll eat that, right? And I think that's important, actually, as a, as a, as a thing that can be created. So I think we've always celebrated that, right? Like what's unique and different and, and about Portland and we've always tried to nurture and show the way. We, we actually went through this whole... Yeah. What, What's that? The Church of Church of Elvis. Church of Elvis yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, all those kind of things, and there's more of those things. Like, and that's another thing that we, you know, pre-COVID, you know, Portland was on this this ride, right? And and we got, you know, this honestly, the business I'm in, it was pretty damn easy back in 2019. Like okay. everything with the hotels, were like so happy because they could, they had really high rates and they're full. And uh, it was kind of a, it was kind of an easy ride. And then the bottom fell out for everybody. And our road back has been tougher than almost any of our counterparts. There's only, maybe Minneapolis is probably the only city that's had it as hard as us in terms of trying to build back that, you know, that business. And it's, um, you know, so we have to really kind of consider not so much, you know, a lot of people around the time were kind of nostalgic, especially with a lot of the issues we're doing now. You know, what, remember when Portland was like this and can we go back to, no, we're not no, going back go because back. guess what? It also wasn't great for everybody. Right. Um, and so there's a, a future, the future Portland I'm really excited about, you know, and I'm really excited about where we can go and I think that's the Portland where more people can be involved in the, the good stuff and the benefits of all those good things. And the uh, and ultimately the the wealth of that as well. Yeah. So so food is or or music has been called the new gastronomy, and Travel Portland does a lot to promote the food culture. So I'm going to go back to yeah, Jay's yeah, yeah. question. So back to your question. Yeah. Um, is is in terms of what we do? I think we yeah, we, got out of that one too. we have typically <laughs> we have typically celebrated what is different, what is on the neighborhood level, what you can enjoy that's not the same as every place else. Um, and, and, and the venues are part of that. Um, in fact, I can tell you one specific tangible thing. So we have an app uh, called Near Me Now. Um, if you go on uh, to the app you know, on, your, uh, on your phone, you can download this app, and it's a sort of curated places. Wherever you are, you can find, I see Sam over there, who's, who's helped a lot with that stuff. Sam's a, Sam's a friend of Travel Portland. Um, and uh, we, um, that app, we actually just layered in and partnered with, with uh, Music Portland. Um, it's called, what, it's called uh, Here Now. Near here. here. Near here. Near here. So that's another uh, app that has all the venues, and we're actually layering all that. That'll be live, I believe, in mid-April. We're layering all the venues into Near Me Now, so people can find not only a great place to eat, um, a great cup of coffee, a great bar, but they can find the nearest music venue wherever they are in the city. You know, So those are kind of how we're trying to celebrate. The, but everything that we celebrate happens on a neighborhood level. Um, and we try to surface that for people to discover uh, at that level. That's amazing. So I know that uh, Travel Portland is at a lot of the tables about Portland's future. I know that you guys had a, um, a seat at the table with the governor's round table about uh, downtown task force. Um, what is your reaction to Shane's sort of proposition statement about using music as the nail rather than the hammer? And um, how, what do you think are some specific obstacles, you know, similar to uh, ask Mara, like what are some specific obstacles do you think to that strategy being successful here? Yeah, I think um, it, it pretty much aligns. I mean, I think music um, is part of a larger creative culture that we have here. And I think what's been really um, sort of becoming very clear to me in terms of, you know, branding and, and, and sort of thinking about how do we talk about Portland to the rest of the world? Um, and one thing, and I didn't come up with this, but it's something that stuck with me. I don't remember who said it years ago, but it essentially is the idea that you know great brands are the same on the inside as they are on the outside, um, or very close. To that so that perception of us as Portlanders of what we think of our city, um, the closer that, that that perception is projected on the outside, um, th that's a, that's what a good brand is, right? Now. Sometimes that perception is negative, sometimes it's positive, but the authenticity that comes through it means that we think of, our, that, that people on the outside are gonna think of our city the same way we think of it here, you know? And if that's, 
if that's good stuff, then they're going to recognize it for what it is. So I think the idea of, of branding ourselves, as long as it's rooted in creative culture, I think it's and I think music is part of that. Food is part of that. Even the outdoors is part of that. Um, our, our local retailers are part of it. You know, going to record shopping in Portland is, is not like in every, every other city. Going to bookstores in Portland is not like in any other, every, every other city. So all those things have a very unique quality here. And I think music fits very well into that. So I think it's a broader creative culture kind of brand than it is just specifically a music brand, which I also think is a differentiation from a Nashville or an Austin. I think it's, it's tough to be singularly just aligned with just music. It has to be part of a larger ecosystem, I think. Yeah, I'm a big fan of creative ethos as a brand, but Shane, how many cities are you working with that are specifically investing in upping the profile of their, of their particularly popular music ecology? How many cities right now are investing in that? That work maybe about 25, mm -hmm. maybe that we know that are doing it. That we're not working with probably another not another 25. Yeah, it's it is a it's a global trend that doesn't just integrate it with a larger story. It identifies it as a valuable asset. So that's I guess what I'd be interested yeah, I, in talking about. Yeah, I think as an outsider, like again, like I guess I have a different view of Portland to all of you because you live here. Um, I think we all struggle with defining the word independent, right? In music, it's a very misleading word. Yeah. Um, or, or, or it could have many meanings rather than being misleading. Of all the cities that I've been to, even just you driving me from the airport, like this is a city that truly is independent for better and worse. Like you're independent sometimes in a, in a, neg in, in a way that can cause issues, yeah. but also you're, it, it's, and, and every time I'm here, I'm like, it's, it's a city that goes out of its way to do its own thing. Um, sometimes for no reason at all, uh, <laughs> other than just, just to do spite. it. But, but no, but I, I think that there's something. And you something, can't stop us. <laughs> yeah, but that, that is, uh, you know, the, the word unique is all in the eye of the beholder, right? The words authentic and unique, they're meaningless in general. They're, they're, they mean to what, it, they mean whatever. And, but my experience with Portland has always been like, this is, this is a place that, for better and worse, is not like any other place. Like that goes out of its way to not have a Starbucks on every every mile. That goes out of its way to 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 work really hard to foster independent business um, in in whatever sector. And that comes with it greater risk, right? Because when you have Starbucks and and those types of companies, they are more stable than an independent coffee shop. Uh, but but I, I think that's a benefit, and that's something that should be celebrated. And I, I was telling you earlier, I find that sometimes my experience in Portland is every when I'm here, people feel kind of ashamed of all the success that you've had. And like, why, why, stop? Like, get over yourself. Yeah, I, I agree, like, you get over it. Genuinely get over yourself. This and, place is awesome. And I, I, and I think that now that we're coming out of COVID, and you do have some real serious you're right, big city problems in, a, in not a big city. Um, I think there's an, I think leaning into the fact that you guys have spent, you know, decades and decades and decades creating this ecosystem that prioritizes independent thought, independent, you know, independent risk, independent chance, some successful, some not. Um, I think that is an incredible asset as we're coming out of COVID. You know, because you're not a city that is just looking to build more white castles. Right. You know, I love White Castle. But, uh, we don't have White Castles. We don't have any White Castles. We don't have any White Castles. We don't have any. All right, well, step one. <laughs> all right. No, but I'm... <laughs> right. Uh, but I'm... Uh, all right, you have an In-N-Out burger at least? But no. No, uh, no. no. Oh my, see, there you go. It's. Uh, you don't need it. You don't need it because you have... Portland's version. Yep. Um, Killer. Kill, but that, that, that's where it comes from, from my as an outside. You always have Portland's version. Mm -hmm. And I find that incredibly fascinating and incredibly interesting and just something that I want to keep learning about. 
because Portland's version is always going to be something a bit different. And lots of cities don't have their own versions. They have White Castle. Yep. And they have in and out Burger. And, I, and, and, and when it comes to music, it's, it's that on steroids. You have Portland's version of music, which is, you know, nationally and in many ways globally known, right? And it's not just <laughs> indie music and, and clangy guitar bands. It, there's a lot more, mm-hmm. uh, as I know. And, um, and I think that what an opportunity to, um, to leverage the value that you've built over the last many decades. I, I did want to add, one, Please. when I was going on and probably not answering the question earlier, I was, um, what you had said about, um, White Castle for me in, in terms of branding this, our music scene and our creative scene in general, I think it, and the way our neighborhoods are constructed and the way you kind of experience Portland, I think it needs, to, discovery needs to be the center of it, right? I agree. Yeah, and totally. it reminds me of one city that I thought did this really well, if I am comparing, is, I, I, it's been probably six years now, I went, got to go to uh, Iceland Airwaves uh, in Reykjavik. It's, and it's different now. Yeah, okay, that's, and, and, but back then, it was mostly bands you never heard of. They're mostly Scandinavian bands. You couldn't pronounce the names. They were mostly consonants. If there were any vowels, they had umlauts, you know, and it was like, um, but that wasn't the point. You, and people came from all over the world to go to Reykjavik um, and, you know, walk around, and there, everything was a venue, you know, you'd walk, there's a club, there's a bar, there's a, a storefront, yeah. um, and there's an opera hall. They were all venues, and you, you could get a bracelet, and you can go into any of them mm-hmm. and experience new music. And that was the mindset of the people that went there. And it was, it was really okay. great. Like, that, that's a good... So I've been, I've been to... Th- I, mean, I think I've been to 13 Iceland Airwaves. I used to work for an Icelandic uh, uh, artist. Um, and... Uh, when I met you, and um, a long time ago. It's my dear friend Misha, everybody. Uh, and he's British and lives here. Yay. So he's got a good accent for all of you. Uh, but um, thank you for the beer. But no, Reykjavik, Reykjavik is very interesting. It's, it's a little smaller than Portland. Yeah. It's more compact than Portland. Um, but the city, pri- the city essentially, they, they worked really hard to leverage the music ecosystem into a ephemeral celebration, right? So Iceland Airwaves, which you should all go to if you've never been, it's great. Um, it's gone through peaks and troughs. It used to bring famous artists, they lost a ton of money, and now it's back to local artists. Yep. But the city, um, the city has, you're right, embraced that any, anywhere can be a venue. Um, but Iceland has a national music office. The city has a music officer. They have um, three full-time people. Reykjavik is a UNESCO city of music, right? Which is, again, a brand, but still important. Um, and, but I would argue that Iceland, probably from an artist perspective, is comparable to Portland, right? In terms of the artists that have been exported. The one thing that Iceland, that, sorry, this, as an aside, the thing that most people don't know that Iceland's biggest export is film and TV composers. Mm-hmm. If you've ever watched an episode of Law and Order, the music on that was an Icelander. Bum, bum. Wow. Of any Law and Order ever, right? They, they have, yeah, they have won more Grammys for film and television com- composition um, than any other country in the world. It's Iceland, al- Iceland, but that, and that's like they, lev- they, they leaned in on something. Um, I know one of the, they, they've won Oscars, like, mm-hmm. and I think that Port, again, coming back to Portland, it's like you have so much raw talent and uniqueness mm-hmm. and it, it just needs to be massaged or leveraged. In a different right. Way. And I want to acknowledge Travel Portland, um, for the past three years, they've been a primary key sponsor for Portland Music Month, which is a local music festival, multi-venue, month-long, citywide festival of discovery featuring lots and lots of amazing, talented for the most part, local performers. And, you know, we are just doing analysis right now, and 43% of our web traffic to portlandmusicmonth.org came from 
more than 50 miles outside of Portland, and more than 1,000 people were looking at it from outside the country. So there is a real appetite, and I think a thing that we're going to continue to evolve that is really centering in the same way that the food culture was kind of cultivated to say, we don't need outsiders telling us how good we are. We're just good. And that's an exciting thing. And I've appreciated the support. No end. Yeah, you, of course. You are, ju- you are good. We're good. We're awesome. We're good. You are. You deserve you. <laughs> Pat on the back. Um, we're good but, enough. But, we're smart enough. And doggone it. And be, like be, us. That is a very dated reference. Yeah, I, mean, just so I know. I know. It's very, <laughs> I'm dated. Uh, but, but, lo- but, but many, many, you know, most cities are good. Yeah. Right now, unfortunately. Reykjavik is good. Eugene is good. Seattle is good. Boise is good. Yeah. Um, Spokane is good. Sorry, I'm, I, I've been working there, been there. Um, I could list other cities in the Pacific Northwest, but I won't because I, I don't want to upset Screw anyone. those guys. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, one thing you did say, but uh, you know, when we've loved supporting Music Portland, I think if I'm comparing like the experience in like a place like Reykjavik, one thing that and it's those little wonky operational things that can make a huge difference sometimes. The bracelet was magic, right? And I know there's a ton of stuff around that we've talked about it. Yeah, I'm not we'll gonna get there. I swear I know. to God, we'll get there. But breaking down the the sort of just idea, you know, making it an accessible thing for somebody to come in from the outside mm-hmm. and just go and enjoy venues without having to worry about buying, mm-hmm. you know, ten different tickets, right. um, it, is a, was a huge thing because yeah. it just made it so easy to have that experience. Yeah, and the, the Seattle Cloudburst thing we've yeah. talked about, which is amazing. Yes, I said it. it's like Macbeth. You can't say Seattle. In All right, so, Shane, you get the last formal question. I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience as well, if anybody has questions. Yes. But my last question. The answer 42. Yep. <laughs> It is the answer is 42. What should the folks in this room and Portland's music industry broadly be thinking about and doing next in order to make the vision that you see a reality here in Portland? I think if you're a musician, just make great art. That's step one. Um, That's the most important thing. When I I was in a terrible band in high school, well, I was, and we were terrible, um... The advice that I got from a, a, was don't suck, <laughs> buy a van, and it's hard. Yeah. Those were the three things. Um, but no, but in all honesty, um, the most, you know, creating art that matters to you and creating art that you're proud of and musicians' sole most important job, because musicians have many other jobs, but the most important job is to create great art. Um, number two is we have to sing from the same hymn sheet yep. as much as possible. And you guys are so lucky because you have a conductor. Essentially, lots of cities do not. Most governments that we work with, and, and we've worked with a lot of them, um, they will use the excuse of, we don't know what they're asking us because the music community is arguing amongst itself about what it's asking. It happens all the time, by the way. Um, having a singular ask one at a time genuinely one at a time if you want to accomplish something you have to do it in a linear fashion Um, having someone obviously in city council who is uh, uh, understanding of these issues vote Jamie uh, will uh, will help that does help Um, so being organized so if you if you have a challenge, if you have an issue, if, if I would bring it to her first before bitching about it on social media, um, genuinely, it's not helpful. Um, and we need to be organized and pragmatic. So the music community here has to identify the things that it wants to change and the things that it wants to impact and speak with as much as humanly possible across genre, across discipline, across socioeconomic background, across geography, across race, all those things, as much as possible, one, two, or three voices. Um, also, you know, I think that this, like, I think that everybody here, one, uh, in addition to that is, I feel that there, everyone needs to just be, be prouder of, the, of, of where you live in that sense, in this context. I think that this understated 
quite Canadian in a way, um, <laughs> like way of thinking. It thank is. You, like, thank you. You know, like it is. Sorry. You know, let's not let's not make sorry. Let's not make too much of a big deal of it. You know, yeah. You don't have to be a dick, but you can still um, you you can still be proud of of the fact that you you guys live in you know arguably one of the most important music cities in the country. You do top five. Yep. Let's um, give it up for us. Yeah. <laughs> But you're not even in the top 20 in terms of music policy. Nope. So, you know, um, a uh, lot work. By, any, by any stretch of the imagination. Yep. Yep. Um, I was telling you in the car, I think Tulsa is doing way more work than you guys are doing. Okay. Um, so, I'm trying really hard. It's, <laughs> no, no, it's, well, it's, yeah. Um, and, and the last, you know, is, is we, this isn't a music thing, but this is something that I have just, learned um, there are a couple of things that I genuinely try really really hard to do as a human being and for those who know me I hope I do them you can ask my partner but one is to never assume okay we have all we have our implicit and explicit biases when it comes to music we all love what we love some of us love certain genres and don't understand other genres but if we're trying to um, create a music ecosystem in a city that works for everybody, we have to try to check them at the door and separate our love for individual music from our desire and love for music to be a wider benefit to the community. That's hard. It really is. Like, especially if there are certain genres that you don't understand or you don't listen to. And Portland is a big enough city that there is everything here. I know there's, I know there's a really good um, uh, death metal scene here, for example, because mm -hmm. I, I like that kind of, some of that music. Uh, but, um, it, and there is, but, and, and the, this is, I'm sure, the thing that I've always said, the most important thing that you can do genuinely, and this is, I'm gonna end on this, the most important thing that every single person can do is vote in local elections. Yes. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Regardless, I have learned this, and this is everywhere. Um, we have huge problems in the UK of people not voting in local elections. Um, and, and in the UK, they've made voting harder. Like, you know, we, 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 have, we have bad policies too. Um, but that is so important because regardless of how things are going in this country nationally, whatever you believe, or, or statewide, whatever you believe, it is local government that you're most going to be interacting with. Right? It is always local government that, you know, that you will see impact your life the most. I'm not saying the only way, obviously. And I say this not as an American thing, I mean in general. And very few, it is, it is amazing how few people vote in local elections. So it's not just the music community has to come out and vote. And maybe one thing that you could do, which has been done before, um, it was done in New Orleans in 2002. So this is not something that I in any way created, but have a, mu have a music hustings. If you know the word hustings, sorry, it's a British term for you bring all the mayoral candidates or the city council candidates together, and you have this about music. And you have Jamie and the other people vying for city council, and the musicians come and you ask questions. I don't know where the there's word- a, There's 120 of them. Running? So you there's, you there's actually 65 right now running yeah, for city council. Well, so. you invite the ones that care the most, right? Yeah. You say, we want to do this. Rent They're out a big like, venue. Hey, 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 just can, can we, can just we very have... briefly, I, I want know, to just that... give a shout out to Laura Stride, yeah. and hey, Debbie hey, Kitchen, hey. also Vadim Mazursky, who's running for Metro Council. Yep. Wow. Yep. All right. We have, but and did I miss anybody? This is amazing that you guys are all here. But we so Give there them all money. Of, it may just be, it may, and again, I'm not. I'm saying this without knowledge of Portland, but it, sometimes it's just the, the mayoral candidates that do this. But, and, and I'm sorry, the word, yeah, the word in, in British English is hustings. I don't know why. I'm making that a thing but, here. Um, yeah. But this is a, the music community comes together and grills um, uh, city councilors, mayoral candidates, whatever, in an organized way. So Music Portland could have a couple of them and say, we are going to invite city councilors that care to come and answer questions from the music community. You'd be surprised how, how, um, how that builds bridges. We've done it in the last three you, elections. You you we call it, it we call it face the music. Sorry. And um, 
as a result, I think that um, people. I, I like husting. I'm cool. making husting. I know again. it's a thing. I like um, that. But but as a result, already the people that are in city council that have gone through that gauntlet with us, I think are already more predisposed yeah. to hear us. Absolutely. So it's absolutely an evolving you, but thing. You, but you don't know what you don't know. Yep. And like we 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 sometimes feel that we we feel I've learned this, and I've worked with all the all sides of the aisle. Okay. I am a pragmatist. I will do what I Forest. think. Yeah, well, I have worked with him. I've met him he, a few times. Um, no, but we, we have to try really, really hard to treat people as people. Mm -hmm. um, and you live in a polarized country. I live in a polarized country. But the, the solutions are going to come in cities. The solution to the climate emergency, to me, will start in cities. The solution to racial equity is in cities yep. and to and to investing in our music and cultural ecosystem for economic development for equity for tourism that will come in cities and again uh -huh. you do that by you do that by um they get it. by by engaging with each other on a person to person level like i have learned that i have met some people who i vehemently vehemently disagree with um, and, and, you know, you, you know me, me, you know my personal politics, but my personal politics are not, do not impact my job. And I, I've learned that what an incredible way to bring people together is through music, but it, but you got to vote and you got to bring people together through music. If you don't, then you're going to have city councilors who don't know what they don't know and they will make decisions based on what they know. And if they don't know what, and they won't make the right decisions. So we have to stop thinking emotionally. We have to stop and pour, we have to stop seeing this as a dichotomy and seeing this more as a fluid process. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And poor, and, right and uh, in a city that has dealt with so much, a city that has been at the precipice of the, um, of the George Floyd issues, you guys are facing a homelessness and, and, and drug crisis that is way bigger than the city that you are. You're facing, to me, like an L.A. style issue in yeah. a city the size of Portland. Yep. Like, you know, but you, I believe that you are also a city that can rise to the occasion and find solutions. Yep. You just have to, you just have to do that. And music is one of the ways that you can. Thank you. And the start is maybe to vote for the people in this room. <laughs> Awesome. Does anybody here have any quite? Oh, Charity Montez is back there also. She's with the City Arts Program. She, the City of Portland is doing good stuff with the arts. So, hi, Charity. Um, questions? Beth, please. I just wanted to say that also the whole metro area is important, not just the city, yeah. but also the county of Multnomah County, um, and that people should register to vote by April 30th. April 30th. And there's a primary election coming up May 21st. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Beth. Ours is May 2nd in the UK. Oh, lovely. Same, same. We're like, vote, vote, vote. No one votes in local elections. In the no. UK. Kylene. Yeah, on the um, topic of musicians, professional musician, and one of the most frustrating things about this conversation is that the well being of the musicians is never part of it. Mm -hmm. Fair. Um, and I am interested in. Uh, a unique approach being this city takes care of its musicians and that's how we support and and, and sell it honestly so, so what so what does that mean like let's so let's this dig is into where this my question is is yeah. have have you seen any models for this yeah. in other countries that we can take from those playbooks build it into what we're asking we're going to try to build up the community because in, in the examples of Austin and Nashville many friends live there they can't afford to live there once they become music cities because now they're famous yeah. and, and, and people are, well, cost of living is going up and nobody's considering what is it like to make a living as a musician? Can you afford to live in the city that you are lauded in? And so can Portland be a city that is respected because it takes care of its musicians? Of course, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a go. Um, first off, that's you're totally right and I, 
didn't in any way mean to discount that. I didn't. Um, thank you for being here, by the way. Oh. That was, no, no, no. I meant to say that first. Uh, but I'm going to... I'm going <laughs> to... Read, his, read his book. He talks about it. <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to... Um, well, no, I, I want to say some slightly uncomfortable things as well. So, all right. First off, we live in a world that, that is not paying teachers and other first responders and nurses what they deserve. This is not a musician's issue. This is a, an issue of what we value. We also, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, lots of these countries are genuinely built to defend property rights over human rights. So our land use policy was built to defend property rights first, human rights second in the 1920s. And that was obviously a response to reconstruction and all sorts of things. Um, and, I, and, and there are far greater experts than I am at that. We, there, there's, there's no simple answer to this question. The simple answer to this question is universal basic income. And is that, and that, yeah. and healthcare. And healthcare, yeah. which, which is not a simple answer politically in this country. Uh, although there's some amazing uh, case studies going on in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Chicago. Okay, uh, and I'm and in Ireland. There's a really big one in yeah. Ireland. Um, I think there, what I have learned is a couple of different things in this context. One is, is that we all have a very traditional view of what a musician is as a job, and that needs to change. And it comes back to what I said about we prioritize what we can see. So this, and, and we also prioritize, I think, a nostalgic view of musicianship based on people, you know, most of us are, are in, you know, are not, there's no, there's very few Gen Zs here. Uh, or whatever, or Z's, or whatever you call it. Yeah. Uh, so, but um, he just showed he's foreign. <laughs> I am foreign. It's funny. Um, and music is a very complicated industry, um, and and it is that, that makes it worse for everybody. So, the more complex music is, the more we kind of um, we, we create simple, simple but inefficient pathways for musicians to make money. And, and the, the concept of the, the middle class musician gets lost, right? I think a musician who plays weddings as their day job is just as valuable as someone who's playing in an, an original band. Um, so one is, is most cities do not have the economic framework to understand music as a business that trickles down into how musicians are valued. That's step one. But I wanna, but this is, this is giving me, a, like, let me riff for one second and you can yell at me afterwards. But um, no, no, this is, this is the fundamental thing that I'm working on right now. And this is the thing that, that I'm hoping you can see. This is, I'm really, pardon my French, fucking passionate about this because it drives me mad, is that um, there are 195 countries in the United Nations. If anyone knows that, 195 countries. There's 203 countries in the countries in the world. Of those 195 countries, over 100 of them lack music copyright infrastructure. Right? Think about that. So that means that in all of those countries, including some very populous ones, Indonesia, Bangladesh, I'm not picking on these countries. I love both of them. Amazing food. Uh, but um, but I'm just picking them because there, there's a lot of people who live in those countries. Um, music is not a f an economy, full stop. So you cannot be a musician living in that country unless you leave. You can either leave literally, physically, you as a human being, or you engage with the music industry, and what happens is you offshore, right? Your content leaves, and it has to be signed to a foreign entity, so your copyright is managed by a foreign entity. So if over 100 countries in the world do not value music literally as an economy in and of itself, then music is a utility. So being an artist then is to service the utility. Therefore, you service a utility by performing mo mainly in cash in hand based scenarios. You get paid for the work that you do in that moment. The United States is one of the lucky ones in that for the most part, copyright here is valued. 
and that is a very complicated um, situation. And I'm happy to talk about it after if anyone wants to nerd out with me, because there's lots of challenges here. But but in general, okay, copyright exists and is valued, um, but it's not understood. So cities will go out of their way, and again, I don't mean city councils, I mean cities in general, will go out of their way to prioritize showcasing the best music that we can see. Therefore, let's have a band at the reception. Let's put on a community festival. Let's get a band on a first Friday or a farmer's market or whatever. And that usually is, again, a utility-based um, Transactions, so you get paid to play, right? Without an understanding of the um, the the value that that music is bringing that we can't see. So, with a lack of understanding of how the music industry works, and the music industry is a copyright-based, intellectual property-based industry, that is that you know a song is a pension. I keep stressing a song could be a pension. Um, the fact that we prioritize um, what we can see, which tends to be music that we pay for on demand, right? And the fact that music is this tool to sell other things, like Spotify is a tech company, <clears throat> Apple is a tech company, they're not music companies. They do, they do incredibly valuable work, and I have friends in both, but they're not music companies. They use music to sell something else. They sell a tech platform, or they sell this, they sell operating systems. So once we break all that down, we realize that there's this entire system that is based on devaluing the art and devaluing musicians. So to try to build that back up in a community is really, really hard. So one way, so there's a, there is a, quite a lot of work being done around, around the concept of fair pay um, I worked on a project with a, a nonprofit in California called Whippoorwill Arts uh, to investigate every fair pay mechanism around the world and try to understand them. Fair pay is only fair in the eye of the beholder, but um, and and to try to create a living wage in that sense, right? For musicians, at the same time you have you have union scale and you have non-union scale and. I find that we, we end up in this situation where we kind of fundamentally forget that, that we are talking about something that we don't fully understand. And those who are most negatively impacted, I hope I still make sense, are musicians. How to change that? There are, there are blunt instruments like UBI. There are blunt instruments like fair pay schemes. One of the best things is that we did this, we've done this in like 20 cities now. If, if the city, if a public sector organization or an organization that is part funded by the public sector hires a musician, they have to pay a, a living wage. We've done that in loads of cities, right? And I think that's, I think that's $84 an hour per musician. I think it is per three hour performance or and that includes load in, load out, sound check. So it's like 250 bucks a musician. A musician, not a band. Um, which is r relative to union scale, something like that, right? So, so there's that, right? In terms of the private sector, if you have a, uh, it's tricky because you, you, we built a system based again on the ignorance of ubiquity. So we have a, a system where we all think we can get anything that we ever want. Every song ever recorded is on this. And by the way, of every song on Spotify, what, 48% have never had a play, right? And 80% have never had over 1,000 plays. So Most of mo my albums. Yeah. <laughs> so it comes back to, to me, three different arguments. One is, do we, uh, do we advocate for musicians as key workers? And then we have the same argument of nurses, teachers, everyone else? That's one. Two is, do we at least try to put safeguards? It's okay. Misha. Opa. Misha, ladies and gentlemen. Do we put safeguards in where we can? Therefore, in union venues, in city-funded contracts? Or do we work hard to try to lift 
the value of music for everybody. And I've realized that the third thing of working hard to get to try to be a better translator, to explain that music needs to be more valued across the shop is the way to do it, but it doesn't bring immediate results and it pisses people off on the process. So I don't have a good answer to the question, but I hope that articulated the way I think is that first off, if we live in a world where there is no such thing as a global music industry, because music cannot be an industry in over 100 countries, then a, uh, that, that's where we're starting this argument. So we have a lot of work to do to articulate the value of musicians um, as, you know, as the, you know, as the, more than Mira, Mira for, is the beating heart of where all this comes from, and then create a system to properly remunerate them. Because, again, it's, it, everyone loses, right? In, in if, let's just take, I don't want to pick on a country because I, I, I adore the country and I love it. If anyone's Indonesia, I love it. It's an amazing country. But like, it's not just Indonesian artists that are losing out. It's, it's American artists, British artists, um, French artists, Colombian artists, Nigerian artists who are having their music played in Indonesia and not seeing any money. So it's both sides that lose. Everyone loses. And, um, and I think that there's a, again, I, that a lot of good things are happening right now behind the scenes that, um, that, are, that are moving things in the right direction. So I hope that all made sense because I'm like a beer and a half in. You're doing great. Yeah. All right. Running low on all time. Right. I'm going to give Ajay a last opportunity sorry, to give the closing sorry. words. But thank, yeah, because I, I know that I went on for I got, I got some, I don't, nobody leave yet. That. We have to sell books tonight still. So yeah. nobody leave yet. But Ajay, final closing words for you. Yeah, I, I talked earlier about the uh, comparing the food scene and, and all the change that's, <laughs> that's come about there and, and how we've really seen uh, our, this emergence of BIPOC um, creatives and, and chefs and uh, restaurateurs in that scene. And I think that that, that wasn't, you know, that was something that was purposeful in a lot of ways and nurtured by a lot of people who saw the, the fact that a lot of people have been shut out of the success of the Portland food scene for a long time um, and kind of people, you know, getting out of the way a little bit uh, at times and also supporting people. And I think in the music scene as well, you know, genres like hip hop, you know, in Portland, for instance, have typically been not treated well by both venues and by law enforcement uh, in it's particular. Uh, Hip-hop is criminalized um, in a lot of places. And, and uh, <laughs> that hasn't really changed enough yet. You know, that's in, and I'd also say that we have, you know, it's been recognized uh, as we have a legendary jazz scene in this town yeah. mm -hmm. that hasn't been celebrated enough or yeah. really sort of raised up enough. Um, I mean, the... Portland used to be a, a West Coast stop for like jazz legends, yeah. Yeah, waiting for someone to say this. Yeah, and and we we need to reclaim that in some Absolutely. ways. And we just we just lost one of our only um, jazz clubs in town, yeah. dedicated jazz clubs. It's and yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, awesome! Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so Jack London, one of the few. Yeah. I, I would just s close with saying that we need to center that idea of change and social justice and bringing people that have been shut out of the conversation and not had equity to, to center them in whatever we do to uh, champion the music scene here. Absolutely. Yeah. Mara, closing words. Oh, geez. Very brief. No, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Founded every yeah. music scene. Yes. yes. Every music scene. Ever in any, yes. in America. And in Portland. Even bluegrass. They are the reason. Yes. The it's true. Absolutely. The reason that we put music on the map in this city. 100%. So we need to, we need to lean music, into Music that. Portland. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Music Portland had our insurance canceled without warning because we put up a page about anti-black racism and music history in Portland. Our, the insurance company dropped us just instantly. Um, yeah, so it's, we're, we're, we're with you, and it's 100%. absolutely a priority for us. Um, in general, 
I'm just thrilled. I'm thrilled to call Shane a friend. I had I was four days into having incorporated um, Music Portland when he contacted me and said, finally, Portland stands up. Can you come and talk at this conference in Canada? Four days. <laughs> I didn't even know how he found me, but he did. What and it was one, it was Breakout West, I think, in Vancouver. Oh, that was a long time. Or Juno, or one of I don't know. All right. um, in any case, um, I think what's great is feeling as if what we've been building here is part of a global trend. And, you know, this is not an us, them. This is not a Seattle, Portland. There's no competition. We are, we are part of an ecology that transcends our borders. Portland is not Portland. It's not metro Portland. It's the entire state. Music is fluid. Um, and music businesses are dense here in Portland. And our entire story is a complex one. We're excited to have amazing partners and to be starting to have the sort of data-driven movement that is necessary to start to communicate and, as you say, translate with other outside stakeholders and start to tell this story and make this place better than it ever has been because it is engaged music in the part. Shane, take us home. Well, first off, I just want to round of applause for Jamie because yeah. we haven't yet. And look at all the incredible work he's done. Um, I, I just want to first thank you for coming. This is incredible and something I'm not going to forget for a long time. It means the world to me that people actually care about this stuff. When, um, I can tell you how I wrote, when I wrote the book, um, the book took four years to write. I got the book deal and then the first thing my publisher said was, it's time to rewrite the book. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I did with editors. It took another 18 months. And I remember, you know, them saying, you know, this is all right, but it's a bit niche. And I'm like, yeah, it kind yeah. of is a bit niche. I get that. But music in cities may be niche, but music isn't niche. Cities aren't niche. We all live in a city and we all like music. So, you know, I, I just want to thank all of you for your interest for your time. This is a Friday night in Portland. You could be doing anything else but this. So, and thank you to our incredible panelists um, as well. And, you know, I, I also want to have one more round of applause for Mara and the work that she does. Like, I, say, I say this out of experience. A lot of your day kind of sucks a lot of the time. Yeah. All right? So, like, I have been there. Um, no, it, it, is, it, is, um, it is, you know, God's work in that sense is what people say. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, so uh, Powell's uh, has graciously come and is selling my book, which means the world to me because I can't do this without a bookseller. I can't drag books around America. Um, without back problems. So uh, I have pre-signed uh, the books, but I'm more than happy to personalize them as well. But please check out the books in the back. Um, if uh, I'm also, you know, once you've read it, if you want to talk to me or anything, you can email me. I'll give you my email or Mira has it or whatever. And I'm hoping that this, is, this isn't the beginning of anything because you guys have been doing this for years and years and years. But I'm hoping that a night like this catalyzes the value that music has in your community and, re and helps everyone recognize that this is something that you can't take for granted. This is something that can go away, but is also something that you can leverage more than most cities in the world because you're Portland. And I'm hoping that you recognize this incredible opportunity that's in front of all of you and as you're going into a new city council and you're going into um, you know, all, all the changes that we're facing, you recognize how incredible music is. And I just wanna thank you so much for coming. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much and we hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you guys so much for coming.
please stop by and pick up a copy of Shane's book. It's very good. It's m- more than modestly priced. Go g- grab a copy. Thank you guys all so much. Um, drive home. We'll be hanging out. Bye. Bye. Well done.